person as part of our ICPA's ongoing and popular series of information exchange, luncheon sessions, will feature our keynote guest, Deputy Chief Information Officer for the Office of Information Technology, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, retired United States Army Colonel Bobby Saxon. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to start with an invocation. Would you uh, assume the posture of prayer? Talking about some of our charitable causes. The ITPA has been in existence for over 100 years. Due to the dedication of pioneers like you who have deemed this organization worthy of your support. It is through your commitment to serve your communities through good works and your dedication to preserving the telecommunications history that the ITPA has continued to grow over the past months. The ITPA has been in existence for over 100 years. Due to the dedication of pioneers like you who have deemed this organization worthy of your support, it is through your commitment to serve your communities through good works and your dedication to preserving the telecommunications history that the ITPA has continued to grow over the past months. We are proud to support the local capital area food bank whose network of food pantries and banks help address hunger for nearly 600,000 people within our local region who are experiencing food insecurities. The pandemic this past year drastically impacted our local feeding American chapter. At the height of the pandemic, our local capital area food bank distributed 75 million meals and many members of its network have reported between 30 and 400 percent increases in the numbers of people coming through their doors. As the anchor in the area's hunger relief infrastructure, the Capital Area Food Bank will provide 60 million meals to people in need this year by supplying food to hundreds of nonprofit organizations, including Martha's Table, SOM, which is an acronym for so others might be. DC Central Cap, Central Kitchen, Food for Others, MAP, and others. JDRF, Juvenile <coughs> Diabetes Research Foundation, applauds the bipartisan policy priorities announced to help lower the cost of insulin. This framework not only caps monthly insulin costs at $35 per month for those with commercial insurance or those covered by Medicare, but it also establishes a structure to the end of existing rebate systems. Last month's announcement represents significant progress toward our shared goal of ensuring that everyone, regardless of insurance and financial status, has access to affordable insulin. More recently, the USO Metropolitan continued to support our Defenders of the Nation National Capital by opening the first USO Center exclusively for the National Guard. The full service USO is located at the historic DC Armory headquarters of the DC National Guard. And today, I'm proud to announce that with Digital Pioneers Academy, DC's first computer based science focused middle school, are running a back to back, a back to school, excuse me, fundraiser over the summer to help students at Digital Pioneer Academy go back to school. We're hoping to launch our inaugural fundraising campaign and present a grant in September just in time for the new school. I'm honored that we have these related charities and to work with all of these people here and the companies who sponsor. And also, thank you. We have new sponsors who came in literally the last few weeks and have sponsored the existing season and are prepared to go into the next season. So I'd like to thank our Digital Realty. Is, I think I saw Ray Farley here. Thank you, Ray. Thanks for. for bring on Digital Realty, I would like to thank Fortinet, and an ITPA first, uh, we have NASA City, who's come on as platinum sponsors for uh, the remainder of this year and the full next season. So uh, that, that's really exciting to have a government organization like that. Uh, you know, is uh, John Johnson here? John, thank, thank you for that. Um, and at this time, let me turn uh, Colonel Saxon is a combat veteran. He is a recipient of the Legion of Merit, a Bronze Star, a Combat Action Badge, a Paratrooper Badge, and an Air Assault Badge. So don't give him his <laughs> <laughs> He's also 
also been recognized for his leadership in the 2019 Fed 100 Award, as well as the 2019 ARCEA Innovate IT Stewardship Award. Auditory that over the years in his career, he's been handed several dumpster fires. And so we're pleased to have him share his insights on the topic of leading through chaos. Bobby, you have our attention. <laughs> research on her own and thank you for that Donna. I really do appreciate it and thank you all for having me today as uh, your guest speaker um, I get to, I talk a lot at these types of events as a matter of fact I was telling some folks earlier that this is my sixth event in the last couple of weeks as a matter of fact I was concerned about what jacket I was going to wear today because I thought some of you may have seen my other jackets <laughs> because I've been to so many lately. Uh, but this got me really excited because I'm not just talking about IT today, I'm talking about a topic that's really uh, something of passion for me and something quite frankly that I've been working my whole life to try to perfect and will probably spend the rest of my life trying to perfect as well. And that's leadership, in this particular case, leadership in the middle of chaos. <clears throat> now a little bit more about me, not that you don't already know enough, but a little bit more about me. By the way, I just started my clock, so I'm already behind my time, so I apologize if I go long. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from New York City. <laughs> I think we that very quickly. It's supposed to be a slow kind of roll. I'm from Athens, Georgia. For the, those of you who are uh, college football fans, go dogs. Uh, we're very happy that we finally won another national championship. Oh, uh oh, I got someone here in the front. <clears throat> when I was born in Athens, Georgia, I really was born into kind of some tough times. Uh, I grew up in a trailer park in the greater Athens area. My father died when I was young, eight years old. Ended up having three stepfathers before I graduated from high school. I tell you that because later on I'm going to talk about the importance of honesty in being a leader in the middle of chaos. Um, also, because I'm proud of where I came from and the opportunities that were provided to me as well as the opportunities that were not provided to me and how I was able to use those as, in some cases, fuel for the fire and in other cases, as lessons learned, as I went through my life and as I get to here today. My first real job was at the International House of Pancakes. I was 14 years old, and uh, my stepbrother got me a job cleaning tables, uh, which I was very happy for. It was coincidentally on July the 4th, 1976. So all of the other busboys were unwilling to work on the nation's 200th birthday. So I got a job working at the AHA. <clears throat> Within a year, I was the head bus boy at the AHA. I don't know what that really says about me. <laughs> but if you have some dishes that need to be cleaned, I'll talk to you afterwards. I'm probably going to go after that. Uh, then I became a cook at the International House of Pancakes. And so if you've been in the AHA, I have done it at an AHA. Uh, four years from 14 to basically when I graduated from high school, that was my job. And I learned a lot about uh, myself and about the work and about the people uh, being at the AHA because if you ever worked at an AHA, if you've ever been in an AHA, if you went in on a Monday morning, it's a nice and quiet. I normally work Friday night, midnight to seven shifts or Saturday or Sunday morning. So there were drunk people getting ready for hungover, being hungover, or people who were hungover. <laughs> and so I got to know those folks quite, quite well. I paid my way through college. It took me six years to graduate. I like to say that was because I was trying to raise money, not because I kept going to classes, but it might have been a combination of the two of those two. And I've had a lot of experiences, a lot of uh, past lives that I like to talk about. Uh, I'm here today as a deputy CIO and CMS, but in past lives, I have worked on hog farms and chicken farms and ahops. I have uh, run small businesses I have been a former Army officer many years ago, and I have just generally had a lot of different experiences that bring me to the table normally when I get tossed into the dumpster fire. 
Um, along the way, I had a lot of opportunities to learn. But one of the things they taught me in that course was, is how do you help people see what they want as a result of what you really want? And so sitting down and going through a sales call and convincing this person that buying my product or buying into my vision, really, was something that they truly wanted or truly wanted to contribute to was an art that I learned in a Dale Carnegie sales course. And I still use that technique today. Setting a vision. I'm not talking about a strategic plan. I'm not talking about a roadmap. It's like, where do you want to end up? What does the future look like when, when the future is good? And that is one of the core things. And for that little unit that I took over, again, five people in Germany. Berlin Wall was still standing. We, had a, we literally had battle positions to fight the Russians that we went out and trained at because we still fought the Russians like we do now, but, but, <laughs> um, were our enemy. And we had to be prepared to load our gear up and go up there. And I was in a, in a unit that was nuclear capable. We were an eight inch unit. They don't have eight inch units anymore. But we literally could build our own nuclear round and shoot it. But teaching those five people that we could have a vision of we were going to be the best when they had been beat down for two straight years and that they carried that vision on a year after I left, that vision alone was what I think was the key piece, not just the fact that I was confident and I was going to drive them hard and make sure they knew how to actually do the job. So I'm going to fast forward here because we're 25. When I left the Army six years ago, I had, over the course of nine months, I had three opportunities for jobs in the federal government. One was as a deputy CIO, one was as a CTO for organizations that you know, and one was for the CTO of healthcare.gov. Now, the timeline for this was in 2016, and you may remember there was a presidential election going on, and the presidential candidate that ended up winning had said the whole time, I'm going to kill healthcare.gov. And I kept thinking, that's the job I want. <laughs> that, that is where my skill set is going to apply the most. And when they finally hired me, I had to go through eight different interviews. I know, shocking that uh, eight interviews. But five of those times during that interview, and I'm not saying it just because I can say a bad word here. I'm saying this because they literally asked me this. Five times out of eight interviews, I got asked the question, how do you recognize bullshit? And I thought, man, I can't wait to get here because this is going to be a great job. Uh, the lady who led the charge to hire me, that I was actually the only person who applied for the job. And she said, no, no, no. She said, you're actually one of 200 people who applied for the job. And apparently I was the only one who knew how to handle bullshit. Uh, they, they ended up hiring me for the job. But the red flag of how do you recognize BS told me that there were some serious problems in the organization. Now, you may not have been tracking every open enrollment that happened with uh, healthcare.gov, but you're probably familiar with the first one, October of 2013, the, probably the most famous IT failure in the history of the federal government as far as press coverage goes. Well, it hadn't gotten a whole lot better than that in reality by the time I showed up in January of 2017. It was a whole lot less in the news. But in order to make the system work, we were throttling people at the front door. So if you came to the front door, and when we opened the front door on November the 1st, there might be 200, 300,000 people waiting to get in the front door. And we've let in about 5,000 at a time. And while they were in there doing their thing, and was out for hours. Now, if that had been November of, I mean, October of 2013, you'd have heard all about it. Four years later, that was kind of old news, but it was real news at healthcare.gov. And every day for 90 days of that open enrollment, um, they throttled at the front door. And we had performance and stability issues every single day. So when I showed up, I was showing up to replace a legend. The guy's name was Tim Huey. And I'm only saying that because some of you may know Tim. He was with Accenture and he was our acting CTO and really he was a 
he was a systems engineer that we had brought on, kind of a special contract to, to kind of occupy that role for uh, healthcare.gov before my arrival. And I kept being asked, well, you know, or not asked, but people kept implying, but you're not Tim Hewitt. And I finally, to the point where I'm like, if you're looking to hire another Tim Huey, I'm the wrong guy. Because I'm not a systems engineer. You know, I haven't spent my whole life building stuff. I've spent my whole life solving problems. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come in here and bring my style and I'm gonna solve problems. So I showed up in the cloud and here's the date that we're gonna be in the cloud. And I said, I got you back. My team took on front. When I said, I, am, we, I will be held responsible. And we moved into the cloud three months ahead of our deadline, and they have not looked back since then. So being decisive, being confident, empowering people. There's no possible way I could have done almost any of the work that my team did. So I had to give them the ability to be independent, to think on their own, to know that they can own responsibility and that I would have their back. And, I, and the phrase I said all the time was, we're all human, we all make mistakes. But when a mistake happens, I have to know immediately because then I can provide the right kind of communications for that mistake, as well as I can energize other people to help you with those mistakes. There's no longer any more shift or blame shifting. 99.8% uh, uptime in an open enrollment is one and a half hour of downtime. We had one incident during that first open enrollment of an hour and a half of downtime. It was a vendor partner being overly aggressive to move some new code into production. Um, and they moved it in before we were basically ready for that to happen. And it kind of blew the system up to play. But within minutes, they raised their hand and said, we screwed this up and we know how to fix it. And we energized the team, everybody got around them, we, we put up a uh, waiting room, and we went to work, and we got it re redone, we tested it, and we went back live. Now in the past, that would have potentially been days of downtime, because that vendor would have never said, we messed this up, because it was too punitive of an environment for that to happen. Now when I got there, my vision was this thing works. It wasn't exactly some sexy vision, but that it works and that they don't look to me to figure out how to make it work. And we, I created that vision. People bought into that vision. They bought into the vision of going to the cloud and we were successful with that. So I have gotten quite custom. Now I've been at CMS for five years. I came in the door as a CTO at healthcare.gov. I was there for two years. I went then from that to another dumpster fire. About 14 months into that job, this thing called the pandemic started. So uh, being the director for the emergency preparedness and response operations office was like the place to be at that moment in time. Um, and then I've been at OIT for two years. So I, I, back to your question, I've only been at OIT for two years. And I know I have people, I have a lady working for me who's been OIT for 30, I mean, for 44 years. Um, there's so much to learn there. But the one thing that I have learned that I say a lot to people is we don't have a technology problem. We have a culture problem that's negatively impacting our technology. And I say that because it kind of addresses all ills. So one of our initiatives that we have going on right now is called Medicare Payment System Modernization. It should be a much bigger initiative than it is right now. But we're just nibbling around the edges. We're not, and we're not tackling a real problem. You know, we've got eight mainframes, but we're not having conversations about how to get rid of the mainframes. I'd like to have more conversations and a viable plan. And you know, we've tried to convert code off the mainframes from COBOL to Java, and that really at the end of the day doesn't work. It's a temporary solution that's a band-aid at best. So how do we get away from these mainframes? And how do we do it in a way that keeps our business customers happy? Because our business customers are a risk-averse organization. We've been around since the 60s. Medicare E's need their payments made on a, on a regular basis. And there's absolute 
um, a horrifying fear for a lot of folks that we won't be able to make payments. And those mainframes were very dependent on us. And what I want is, is a plan where someone can create the vision that everyone goes, man, that makes sense. Let's go do that. Let's go do $100 million or $150 million a year on our to modernization on Medicare payment systems and do that in a few years versus $30 million a year forever because uh, that's the plan we're on right now. Um, when it comes to infrastructure, we've got a lot of big moving pieces right now around infrastructure. Some new data centers coming to life, a whole lot more work around, around cloud. And that's all important work. But what I would like for people to see is, is how that work is the foundation for real modernization. Because replacing servers is just replacing servers. When I ran a little small company one time, I put in six computers and said that I had a state-of-the-art training center, because I'm pretty good at PR. And one of the companies whose product I was representing said to me something that I thought was very wise. Bobby, it's only state of the art that someone else builds a new one. And then there's a state of the art. The point being is, is new computers doesn't really make it state of the art. New servers or new locations or you know consolidating is different doesn't make us modernize. It may give us the foundation to go do the modernization that we really need to do. I challenge people all the time when it comes to Medicare and to uh, Medicaid and to healthcare.gov. Why can't we create an Amazon kind of experience or a Google kind of experience? Like, I don't know anything in the world. I can go to Google that has one little bitty block, and I can type in a few things, and within minutes, I mean, how many of you have ever been on the Zoom and someone mentions something, and you're typing, and then you go, well, you know, that's a five-star <laughs> restaurant in so and so and so and Italy or whatever. Because we can do that. How many of you have ever ordered anything from Amazon? Probably everybody. <laughs> More importantly, how many of you have ever returned anything to Amazon? Is that not the easiest thing in the world to do? Yes. So why does it take two weeks for a Medicare beneficiary to find out if they have coverage for knee replacement surgery or something like that? Why shouldn't we be able to do that on the fly? Why should we wait, have to wait for approvals for weeks? Well, we ought to be able to do it in seconds, at least minutes, you know, while they're still sitting there in the office for that kind of thing. Why can't I go back and see everything that's ever happened to me with every doctor I've ever had out there? And Medicare spends $1.2 trillion a year on payments. So let's take advantage of that power and force the country to do the right thing in some places. There's so much around standardization and fire and other things that we could do, especially around data, so that we could make it so that you would always have your health record. I can put this, pick this phone up and I ought to be able to walk into a brand new provider and go And now they have all my medical records organized in a way that makes sense. From every doctor I've ever been to, whether it was inside or outside a government provider situation, all of my x-rays and everything. That's possible, and I think that's the kind of work that we ought to be leading at CMS. And now I'm not a policy person, so I don't have those conversations, but I know that's possible with technology. And we ought to be telling people that's possible, and we ought to be driving that conversation. And that's the kind of conversation you ought to have when you come in, not that our thing is better than their thing. Because at the end of the day, we just need to think, you know? And how many of you own a copy of Microsoft Office? How many of you use more than 5% of that capability? You know, think about it. How many of you use Excel? I know the vast majority of us don't use Excel the way that it can be. All my programmers do, but I don't. The point being, you need to think more holistically as a government. You know, the, the, the login.gov, for example. I can go almost anywhere on the internet with a Facebook account, you know, or a Twitter account, or some other account, a Google account. Because I go to places and they go, which one of these do you want to use to log in? Because if you come with that credential, we trust you. But you can't do that in the government. Or you can do it in limited places in the government. How come we don't have that one, one thing? I have been preaching the gospel for several years now about EHRs, because I have some EHR experience. How come we, CMS, 
doesn't say that you, newborn, born two minutes ago, who were born into Medicaid, we've got you. And now we've got you in a system till you die 120 years from now, hopefully. Because as you go in and out of the system throughout your lifetime, you could potentially be in, uh, in all of our systems multiple times. And when you get on Medicare, you may be on our system for 40, 50 years. But we make you go to different places. Inside of OIT right now, if you want to go solve a problem, hopefully you know the URL. Because everyone says we created a really cool website that tells you everything you need to know. And we created it because we have we have 25 fiefdoms at CMS and uh, who have their own budget, their own IT teams, and their own solutions. And then inside of each one of those fiefdoms, we have lots of little mini kingdoms uh, with all these groups and divisions. And they all go build their own stuff. Like, no, I want to go to Google, but I want to go to CMS IT. Google.com, and I want to be able to solve my problem that way. I don't want to have to go all these places. And as the customer experience goes, you should be doing exactly the same. Now, we are putting more time and effort into it. We just, just recently appointed a new customer experience officer at CMS. And we're a lot, a lot more time and effort going into human centered design. Uh, and we're starting to have um, thought exercises on what, is, what does this really mean? We had a speaker in earlier this week that was talking about, it was under the umbrella of human-centered design, but it was really more about engagement. And you know, one of the things that this speaker said was, is most time people do surveys or do uh, journey maps and stuff like that to prove out what they think. And what he said was to us, is he said, you ought to do that to figure out what you should actually think, not prove out what you think. Uh, looking at you for a month, business standpoint, three billion dollars you're overseeing. You got a billion dollars right now to manage it. Can you just highlight maybe obviously talking to the telecommunications industry? Where high level is modernization in telecom? Breaking it down with infrastructure, down the circuits, voice, where does yeah. CMS see themselves, you know, in well, a period of performance? Um we are we are spending a lot of money right now. Some of you may know our infrastructure and user services group. Mark O is the group director there, uh, has been for some time, and we've done a tremendous amount of work with AWS over the last few years, and we're building out two brand new data centers, where we're going to consolidate a bunch of other data centers and virtual data centers, and we're going to really become more of a hybrid organization. But every desk at CMS still has a phone on it, you know, and I don't give that number out. If you ever call that number, I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> because I know I didn't give you that number, so you, I don't know who you are. Um, but that's, every desk has a, a, a phone number. And now we are really heavily invested in Zoom, and there's talk about everyone getting a Zoom phone because we have probably four or 5,000 of our team members that don't have a government issued uh, cell phone. Um, we have to not only update and modernize the things that we have, we also have to kind of rethink how we want to interact in the future. And these cell phones, that we, these desk phones that we have, have all been updated and replaced during the pandemic. Okay? <laughs> it's true. I'm sure we're not the only ones that have done that. But we, that was the time we did that. You know, it's like, okay, well, let's just go do all that work. And all of the great don't we have someone in Cisco? No, someone here didn't like Cisco, that's right. But, you know, we had a bunch of Cisco screens for uh, um, uh, video conferencing and stuff. Most all, most all of those are gone now so that we can do Zoom stuff. You know, so I don't even know that we actually learned how to use those before they don't put them in the So, so we, we, have, we have a lot of visioning work to do. And I think that's where y'all as industry can be helpful. I challenge industry all the time. Every time I speak on a panel, they always go, the last question, now what is an industry to do? Think. I need you to not come in selling me something. Come in here with a vision for what a future should look like. When I have a problem, I need you to come to the table with a creative, innovative solution so that I can seem like I'm smarter to my peers, <laughs> okay? Because I haven't thought of it yet. So you share it with me, and then I can start spreading uh, the gospel. 
that way we can all remember, how do I help that person get what they want? Because I want to get what I want. And that's something I learned in that Del Carnegie sales course. And that's the way that I can need to interact, especially with a lot of our other business owners. I used to be one of you many years ago. So I have a, a kindred spirit, and I have relationships that go deeper than you're trying to sell me something. But that's not the norm. So you have to think about people you're meeting with. And I'll tell you, for the most part, you need to try to figure out how to meet with the business owners, and not the IT. Because we get really comfortable with the thing until we see something sexier. And then we want the new sexy thing. But the business owner needs a solution that will drive them toward the vision that they have. Donna? Uh, thank you. Uh, you might be interested. I, someone sent me an email today and they had a tagline about leadership. I thought you might, I'll share it with you. It says, a leader is a dealer in hope. And uh, that was from the Pulling <laughs> Dog. Um, of course, I, I just wanted to say that this is not the end of the ITPA season. Um, we have an event next month, um, and we'll be right here at the Westwood Country Club. And uh, we hope that all of our sponsors and all of the folks that are here today bring your friends, come, because as uh, Patrick brought out, this, these are the, the luncheons, the dinner, our golf tournament coming up. These are the ways that we are. $30,000 to give to our charity. So your participation is absolutely appreciated and necessary. Um, with that, uh, I do want to mention our golf tournament. That's coming up in October is the month that we'll be having our uh, golf tournament. So uh, look for ways to support that as well. Uh, beer trucks, pole pins, whatever else. Get new clothes, show up. And I'm looking for three scratch golfers to be on my team. Well, you don't want me. Anyway, um, we just want to um, make sure that we mention the dinner and the golf tournament. Please put them on your calendar so that we can continue to support ITPA. And it's pretty amazing the, the amount of money that we've been able to raise because look at this. This is an intimate group. But um, our industry has always been one to connect people and to help people. And so it doesn't surprise me that we've been so successful raising money for our charity. So again, thank you, Colonel um, Saxon. I appreciate it. And uh, me being a former United States Army um, member of sure. Signal Corps. Um, so that's why I said I, I, I do uh, the, the, the field artillery conversation certainly resonates. As a matter of fact, one of my first cousins, he was a fister, which is a, a fire in support. Yeah. Uh, he was stationed at uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, Fort Carson. <laughs> <laughs> Places I know well, so thank you. Um, just want to, again, um, reiterate what Donna said about the charitable causes that we support. Um, it's important that we continue to show presence in the community, um, be a voice for those um, who, who, quite frankly, need our support. So again, if you all are sponsors of ITPA, National Capital Chapter, please continue with your sponsorship support. Um, we welcome your attendance at our annual golf um, tournament in uh, October at the Army Navy Golf Course in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. And I just, again, it, 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 it's very, very important that we show presence in our community. Um, we're here to, you know, promote dialogue and, and share ideas between government and industry for the benefit of our constituents, each and every one of us who sit out here in this audience. Um, but it's also important to then take a deeper dive and take a look at our community at large and support the causes that Again, support the constituency, support those who oftentimes don't have a voice. And I think our charitable causes are, are ones that are meaningful and impactful in our community. So thank you for your support. Um, I want to go back one last time to recognize our sponsor, our um, 
platinum sponsors, Avaya, Comcast Business, Granite Solutions, Government Solutions, Comcast, Lumen, Hughes, <clears throat> and now NASA Soup. For our gold sponsors, Fortinet, BT Federal, uh, Crown Castle, Mattel, Verizon, Genesis, FCRT, at Panoptives, and a whole bunch of sponsors. Thank you for your support. Thank you for all of your charitable contributions, and we look forward to supporting ITPA and CC. Thank you.